The expansion of the 4D program is also being further, um, it's grown out of proportion more because of, of some vague Minnesota law that's on the books right now. In Minnesota 518, 551, sub 9B, this statute is in there. And I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. You've got it in your, in your handout. But the key words here are in white. This statute says, in Minnesota law right now, in all other 4D cases, the, a, the public authority, meaning the agency here, may intervene as a matter of right. Okay, depending on how you read law and how you know about statutory construction and how you know about rules of court, that may or may not make sense to you. That phrase, public authority may intervene as a matter of right, the first thing that you need to do is look at, okay, what are the limitations of federal law? Let's first of all take that into perspective. The limitations are those on welfare and those at risk of falling on welfare. Once that assessment is made before you make a determination if there's a matter of right, then you must look at the Minnesota Rules of Civil Procedure. Rule 2401 says that before a third party can become involved in a case, in a private case, there must be four things that are proven to claim, before you can claim that interest. Those things must be that the interest and the, the intervention must be timely. Two, there must be an interest in the property. Three, there must be um, a, a, a finding that the disposition in that case would impede the ability to protect, for the government to protect that interest. And four, that the interest here of the government would not be pre re represented by the parties. But all four of those things must be true. What's happening, however, is the Minnesota State 4D agency is erroneously chirping this phrase in Minnesota law as an absolute right that they can be involved in every private case if there's an application for 40 services. What that's creating is a problem because it's bypassing the federal 4D law and it's leading to an overly broad interpretation which is leading to an unconstitutional application on that, of that law and it can be perceived as being unconstitutional on its face. Some serious issues involved here with that one little phrase. So with that overreach of authority and expansion of the program, what are, what are the process, what are the outcomes that we face? Well, first of all, you might, wanna, you might ask yourself, how are private cases being recruited into the 4D program? How does this happen? Well, one of the first things that happens is when a private party gets divorced and they're in court, oftentimes the judge will order wage withholding in a divorce situation. In and of itself, wage withholding, income withholding is not necessarily a bad thing. But they're doing this based on some real misinterpretations. First of all, many judges will tell you that they believe wage withholding is required by federal law in every divorce and paternity case. We've looked at the record, we've done the research, that's not true. The truth is the federal law can only require wage withholding in 4D cases. Remember what I said before that they have no jurisdiction over private domestic relations. And federal law allows good cause exemption even in 4D cases. Secondly, many judges believe that wage withholding must be done and can only be done through the 4D system. Well, the truth is that there are three kinds of wage withholding or income withholding. You can either do full 4D services if you want to go sign up down at the county to have them take the money out of your paycheck. Two, there's something called non 4D wage withholding only, which most people don't even know exists, where a, a divorced couple can get the wage withholding service, but they're not in the whole 4D program. There's also private direct deposit now. The 4D agency, the state DHS, is started to, rather than require the non-custodial dad to write their check to the state and then they resubmit a check to the custodial parent, rather than doing that, the state is working with the new banking technology and trying to use direct deposit which is fine and good, but what that also means is two individuals who are divorcing can set up their own direct deposit independent of the government. They don't need the government to do that for them. 
So what happens? Somebody gets an order for a wage withholding, so they go down to the county and they fill out a 40 application. First of all, the, the 40 agency doesn't tell them there's two kinds of wage withholding. They just shove in front of them a 13 or 16 page application, which I have here today if you want to look at it. And they say, this is what you need to fill out the services. So unbeknownst to the custodial parent filling out the application, they suddenly sign themselves into this big program they don't even know that much about. Now, the state law and the federal law do require full notice and full disclosure of everything it means to be in that program, but we can only imagine what is actually said during that application transaction or not said. One interesting thing, too, at the very end of the 40 application here in Minnesota, there's a signature clause. In that signature clause, which the applicant parent signs, one of the key things in there, and it says, I understand that the county attorney's office represents only the county in the state. The county attorney, the 40 agency, does not represent either parent, and the 40 agency does not represent the child. There's so many people, even in the 40 system, that will say, well, we're there for the children. They're not there for the children. The county attorney and the 40 agency are there to protect the government interests. If you go back to what I said before, that the 40 system is based for, provided for those on welfare and those at risk of falling on welfare, the, county, the 40 agency there is there to protect those two interests, the, the money part of it. They're not there to protect anything but that. And that's what they're trying to get across in the application here. So what happens? The, mo the mom, the custodial mom, or the, or the custodial dad goes down to fill out the 40 application. And what we find with this application is there's absolutely no eligibility standards for Title IV cert welfare services. And there's not even a place on the application for the applicant's income. It's not on there. They don't even ask. They don't care. We also find with the 40 application in Minnesota, there's no disclosure of the applicant's income, which I just mentioned, which would be required for means testing. There's also no process in place to notify the other parent that says, hey, due process notice here. You're about to go on a program. You have anything to say about that? Nothing. With the 40 application process, there's also no approval process or assessment process because everybody gets in. Why would they need to assess anything? Well, you know what? You'll see later that in 45 CFR 303.2, an assessment is required. Also, there's no investigation or verification of the accuracy of the information on that um, application. What happens is the non-custodial parent ends up finding in court, not in court, in administrative hearing, that the hearsay provided on that application is all considered fact. That becomes a problem. And also, there's no process in place to close the file when one parent objects. And I'm not going to get into 45 U.S.C. 1301D today, but that is another limitation that goes back to 1935 when the Social Security Act started that says if either parent objects to their child being on welfare and they're willing to take over, they get to take over. That subject is for another day.